In the beginning, when God was creating the heavens and the earth, God stooped down and scooped up some mud and formed it into the shape of a person. Human, God called it, made from humus. God formed us in love from the dust of the earth, created us in love and through love and for love. Love is the source and the goal of our existence. Sadly, that love is too often twisted and misdirected, turned against ourselves or against one another, transformed into lust or greed or one of the other many shadows of love. In the void left by that lack of love for which God created us, we find ourselves hungering. We seek to fill that void with power, with wealth, with the praise of neighbors, or the comforts of luxury, or feelings of purpose. Those things become treasures which we store up for ourselves, trying to fill that hole left by our inability or our unwillingness to love as God created us. Tonight, as we mark ourselves with ashes, both in mourning for what we have lost and in remembrance of the dust from which we were made, we confess the ways that we have fallen short of the existence that God desires for us. We confess that the treasures we seek in life, both good and bad, so often draw our hearts away from the kingdom of heaven and from God. Away from God, who alone is the source of all life, the only source of our being. Separated from God by sin, by our misguided desires and appetites, we acknowledge tonight that we are dying. For that's what happens when, you pull, when we pull ourselves, or when we are pulled, away from the source. Like a flower pulled up by the root, we wither and die. We acknowledge that we are dying, and we express our desire to return to the Lord our God, who is gracious and merciful. We may not love as we ought, but God does, because God can do no other. Love is God's very nature. Where our love falls short, God's steadfast love abounds. We may think that this repentance is a turning away from death, but I wonder tonight, as we mark our faces with this sign of mourning, does Lent call us away from death or toward it? Is the work of God in this season to save us from death or to deliver us to it? The season of Lent began as a time of baptismal preparation. New converts to the church would spend these 40 days in prayer and fasting, preparing to receive the sacrament of holy baptism at the vigil of Easter. Baptism, as Paul reminds us, is death. On the vigil of Easter, these converts would die in baptism with Christ and rise with him in the morning. To be a Christian, then, is to accept death as normal, to embrace it, to welcome it even. But that's not how we usually talk about it, is it? It's much more common to talk about defeating death, or destroying death, or overcoming death. And yet, the very first act of Christian life is to intentionally submit to death, and to do so joyfully, hopefully, enthusiastically. Martin Luther reminds us that far from a one-time occurrence, holy baptism is a daily task of drowning the old Adam or the old Eve and daily rising to new life with Christ. And so for this reason, I wonder if this season of Lent, this season of baptismal promise and focus, invites us not to turn away from death, but toward it. I wonder if perhaps God is beckoning us to 
in this Ash Wednesday to gladly put the old Adam and the old Eve to death, to drown that humus person that stores up earthly treasures which draw our hearts further from our true source. Perhaps we are asked not only to remember our mortality tonight, but to embrace it. I think that embracing our mortality in this context means learning to let go. The traditional practices of Lent, prayer and almsgiving and fasting are all about letting go. Letting go of those things we used to fill the void left by our incomplete love. Letting go of the blessings and the wealth and the privilege that we hoard for ourselves. Letting go of our ideas about where power truly lies. What these practices, or any other Lenten practices that you might keep, actually do is help us be mindful. They ask us to pay attention. Where are we storing up our treasures? They ask us to consider whether those treasures are drawing our hearts toward God or further from God. All of these practices help us rehearse, as it were, for the ultimate letting go, the letting go of life itself. As creatures formed from dust, we are bound to return to dust. When that happens, all the treasures that we accumulate and enjoy here are lost. But what we gain is so much greater. Because we will not only return to dust, but also to our true source, to God. Now we can know God only through that dust from which we are made. We comprehend God with our minds. We feel God with our hearts. We encounter signs of God's presence with our five senses. But when in dust we finally return to our source, then, as St. Paul says, we will know God fully, even as we are fully known. The reality that Lent invites us to see is that whenever we let go of something, whenever we give something up, we are also receiving something, taking something on. When we give up coffee or sugar or television for Lent, we're also receiving an opportunity to see God's world through new eyes, to be mindful of something that we might normally miss because it's drowned out by all the other noises around us. Whenever we give up time or money for the sake of another, we receive an appreciation for what we have, a recognition of the abundance that God gives, a chance to connect with another human person in love as God intended. And that's not true just for us as individuals, but for all of us as a community, as a congregation. Right now, we are all so keenly aware of what we're letting go of. What we've had to let go because of COVID, because of budget constraints, because the ways the world is changing around us for better or for worse, through war and climate change and the struggle for justice by those long oppressed. I hear Lent inviting us to consider how that letting go might be drawing us closer to our source. as we let the image that we have of ourselves as a congregation or as a country or as a people die, what image of us, what being is God bringing to new life in its place? Because that too is the work of baptism. As we open our hands to let go of what was, we are preparing ourselves to receive what is coming. In dying, we are reborn to eternal life. If that's true, then perhaps death is not an enemy to be overcome, not a force to be opposed, not a tragedy to be averted, but simply one of the many ways that God is working to bring about new and fuller life for all creation. Perhaps life and death are not so separate as we think. Maybe they're two sides of the same coin.
This is, after all, the core mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his death, Jesus shares his life with us. And in our deaths, our lives find similar renewal. Even our supreme act of malice and violence against God in the crucifixion served to cause God's steadfast love to abound all the more. That's why I wonder if the good news that this night holds for us might be that God is victorious, is, excuse me, it might be not that God is victorious in the struggle against death, but that even death itself belongs at last to God. That there is nothing and nowhere in which God's will is not ultimately done. And that will is ever and always to create and to recreate all things in love and through love and for love. And that includes us. Our journey of Lent begins tonight with a great confession of our sinfulness, our shortcoming, our helplessness to overcome the nature of that dust from which we were created. But it also begins with the declaration that God chose to create us from that dust, to love our dust into personhood with a love so powerful and so inexorable that the reverberations of that big bang still echo across the cosmos, making all things new. It is that love that will have the last word, because it was the first word, because it is, in fact, the only word. <laughs>